so that all the kids get to class. No, there was not an announcement made. The kids can go to class now. Um, in case you're wondering. Hey, welcome. We're glad you're here. We got a lot of visitors. We're especially glad you're here for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons is because uh, most of our regular members are out. So if you weren't here, we probably wouldn't be, you know, anybody here. <laughs> but we're also glad that you're here because um, if you're looking for a church, I think you're going to know whether or not you like this one pretty quick. Um, because we're about to get down and dirty with God's Word. If you like God's Word, if you like the Bible, if you like what it says, you'll probably like the preaching. If you don't, you probably won't. Um, this is what John Piper calls expository exaltation. It's worshiping over the Scriptures. We preach expositorily because we believe that it offers big truth for difficult times. So it may seem superfluous now to you what we're going to say like it doesn't matter but when something really bad happens the truths of God's word become precious and they need to be big all right they need to be big so before I say anything else let's go to God in prayer and before I pray go ahead and turn to first Corinthians we are going to get down and dirty with it today as we continue worshiping God's word over God's word. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the people that are here, every one of them, the ones that are members, the ones that aren't. As Paul says in the opening lines of this letter, I do not cease to give thanks to God for you, making mention of you in my prayers in every way. Lord, we thank you for these people. We're filled with problems. We're filled with inadequacies. We, we have questions that, that, that need answering. We have things that we don't understand perfectly. Our obedience certainly isn't up to snuff. But, Lord, you sent us a perfectly wise, obedient son to stand in our place, to give us his righteousness, to make us part of his family, to make us sons and daughters. So, Lord, we give him the praise this morning. I ask for help, Lord, that you would keep me tethered to your word, that you would help me to speak clearly and with much grace and compassion and love and mercy. And I pray that you would make us lovers of your word. Help us to love your word and to, and to dig deep into it, not just to give it a touch as we go on to do the things that we really want to do, but that we would be people who love your word Make it, it's, it's living already. Make it alive in our consciousness, in our being, in our persons, in our heart. Make it compelling. Appeal to these people, God, I pray. Appeal to me as I preach. We love you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. The false dichotomy that exists between God's word right? Expository preaching and relevancy is something that pains me deeply. Almost like you, you can't have both. If you have too much Bible, then suddenly you're not, you're not relevant. You're not talking about the issues. Um, and, and the reason it pains me is because when you look at the Bible and you look at the way it's written, okay, and you consider that it's written to a group of people like us, Right? We could very well be the Corinthian church that had its own problems, that had its own cultural issues. It's interesting that, that Paul could have written anything to these people, anything at all. And, and he could have been called relevant by their standards. But, but when he writes to them, right, he chooses to address something very basic and simple, namely, how the body of Christ treats itself. I want you to think about that. Of all the things that these inspired authors could have written, of all the things that the Holy Spirit could tell you, what has been written and preserved for thousands of years is how we interact and treat one another as the body of Christ. And you think, well, why in the world would he say that? 
Because most of us would rather have some kind of mystery or insight or some, some form of knowledge opened up to us, right? Well, well, consider two verses, both from the book of John. John 13, 35. He says, a new command I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, you also love one another. By this will all the world know that you were my disciples if you have love for one another. Or John 17, 20 and 21. Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. If you've come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, you have believed in him through the word of these apostles. We call it apostolic authority. The church is built on it, right? We, we stand on someone else's shoulders. You've come to faith through the words of someone else. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that, you ready? The world may believe that you have sent me. One of the reasons Paul and Peter and the other apostles write the way that they write for us to love one another, to be kind to one another, is because the witness to the authenticity of the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ is seen in the way we interact with one another. That's why you can't go around bad-mouthing the people you go to church with. I mean, besides the fact that it's just mean, spirited, right? And you don't want to be a jerk. That's what jerks do. It's that you, it loses, when Christians don't get along, gospel witness is lost. So when you come to 1 Corinthians, which is a text about how the church should treat itself, how each member should relate to the other, it's extremely relevant for gospel witness. If this doesn't happen, gospel witness is undercut. You go around gossiping about people at your church, slandering them, bad-mouthing, an unbeliever walks away saying, well, I can do that at work. That happens in my family. These people aren't any different. So, <laughs> you know, we focus on the wrong things. We think we need all sorts of things for an effective witness. We can spin out a thousand programs to meet a thousand needs, but if we cannot get along, what are you winning people to? So the title of the sermon is, When the Cross of Christ Becomes Part of the Pallet Wall. You're in trouble as a church, and as people. And of course, I'm speaking metaphorically, right? When the cross of Christ becomes part of the pallet wall, it becomes merely an object, a byword, an incantation, a symbol that just watches us do whatever we want to do, however we want to do it. It just gets lost amongst the other pieces of wood. When the cross of Christ becomes part of the pallet wall, it ceases to be the determining factor in how we see others and ourselves and how we relate to others. That's what I mean by that. When the cross of Christ becomes part of the pallet wall, it, it, it holds no meaning or weight or significance in the way that we live our lives and relate to one another. That's what's happened here. I doubt the Corinthians had a pallet wall in their house church. I don't know. There's nothing new under the sun. But this group of people had lost the meaning of the significance of Christ's crosswork. And here's how we know. The Corinthians love wisdom speech, is what we're told in verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with wisdom words, which is translated, words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. The Corinthians loved dynamic speakers. They would have loved our YouTube society. Loved it, 
Loved it. Put the pastor on the screen. That's okay. 15 satellite churches is good. As long as we can see him, they would have loved it. They loved cult personality orators. And Paul, knowing that they love the dynamic presentation of Christ crucified with all of its rhetorical trappings that just really made their heart flutter when they heard it, refused to do it. To put it in layman's terms, they said, Paul, man, we really don't like the way you preached. If you were a little more relevant. If you told a few more stories. If you were like this guy. Right? If you were like Joel Osteen. Or if you were like Stephen Furtick. If you knew how to rile us up, we'd... Paul knew the appeal that that had. And so when he went to preach the message of the cross, he did it so in such a way that the only thing that they could boast in when he was finished was the message of the cross. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And when I, I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with... Wisdom speech. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And now look at what he says next. And I was with you, the Corinthians would have hated this, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I will not be another celebrity preacher. That's what Paul says to these people. I won't play to your egos, I won't tickle your ears. I'm going to preach the cross and. I'm going to do it in a way, ready, that's congruent with what the cross represents. Weakness, fear, trembling. So when Paul preached, they got a full-bodied message of the gospel. They heard Christ crucified with their ears, and they saw it with their eyes. They did not see a man, an orator, standing, gesturing, posing for a crowd, they saw a man preaching the cross on a cross. That's the point. My actions and my words demonstrated an understanding of what it means to be crucified. So that if you accept it, if you receive this message, it will not be because I'm an eloquent speaker. It will be because the Spirit moved on you and gave you A heart to love the message crucified and a crucified messenger that proclaimed it. So Paul takes the theology of the cross and applies it to his preaching. But the Corinthians have all but forgotten this. It's become part of their palette wall. And they live just like everyone else. So what we have in the sermon today is what happens when the the cross of Christ becomes part of the pallet wall. You ready? I think there are four things. Number one, we forget that the church is a family. 1 Corinthians 1 verses 10 and 11. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers and sisters. Paul could have appealed to these people in any way that he wished. He could have appealed as an apostle, as a disciple, as a messenger, as one who was in authority, as their founding father, but he doesn't. He appeals to these brethren, 
to be unified as a sibling. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree. I hear there's quarreling among you, brothers and sisters. And the reason he does it is because the church is a family filled with people of equal status. Brothers and sisters. A family filled with people that have an equal share in its head. Namely Christ Jesus. The church is a family. It's not the voice. In other words, the church isn't a stage For someone to showcase their gifts and their talents. It's a visible witness to the world of God's gift of Jesus Christ. Period. They were using it the other way. (laughs) I'm of a Paul. I'm of a Paulus. I'm of Cephas. Like it's some kind of amphitheater for the different speakers to come up and perform and then to be judged by them. Well, I like that guy. Well, I sure prefer that one. That's not the way it works in a family. Uncle Rico is allowed to sing every Thanksgiving, and everyone knows it. He can't carry a tune in a bucket, but we give him a guitar and we say, Here, Uncle Rico, go, go, go after it. That's what happens in a family. In a family, you know who's crazy, right? You don't kick them out because they're crazy. You hug them and you just go. So it's not the voice. And it's not survivor either. You know? Get the most talented guy up there, you know. Out with the old, in with the new. It's a family. God sins as a father. Christ comes and obeys as a son. He's the firstborn of many brethren. When people become a Christian, they are what? Born again. The language of family, right? Is, is pregnant when we talk about salvation. It's, salvation is pregnant with the language of family. It's the restoration of a family. The first sin was a sin committed against, well, not the first sin. We'll call it the second chronologically. Be- between who? Two what? Two siblings. And so this family language occurs in the Old Testament. It's carried all the way to the very end. Not just brothers and sisters in Christ. So when the cross becomes part of the pallet wall, we forget that the church is a family. And we don't act like it is. We, we, you know, guys, this is a very small part of what we do. Right? This is just we get together and we worship. But this, is, this little hour and a half slot on Sunday morning is not... Church. It's worship, but it's not church. It's not the church. We've assembled together. We're more than worship. We are family, and that's what they've forgotten. They're the voice. They're judging. Here's the second thing that happens. We dethrone our sovereign Savior and aggrandize his servants or ourselves. Google taught me that word this week means to set up in place of a throne, to make someone important that's not important. So So if you don't like God's word, at least you can leave and say, I learned something new today. I'm going to use that in a sentence at work, impress some people. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 12, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it's been reported to me by Chloe's people that there's quarreling among you, my brothers. And what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Now go to chapter 3 and verse 5. What then is Apollos? 
What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. See what they've done? They've taken the sovereign Savior off the throne and they put one of his servants up there. They said, man, I'll really like it when Jeremiah preaches. Somebody's like, well, I really like it when John preaches. Or I really like it when Tom sings. Or I really like it when Jackson sings. Or I really like it when Amber sings. Or I really like it when Rachel sings. We've dethroned the sovereign Savior and we put a stinking servant up there. And here's the, the tragedy of it. Is in, and this is going to come out later in chapter 3. But one of the reasons that Paul is so against them taking sides is because when you have a preference and you act upon it to divide a church or to cause strife in the church, what you do is you pass judgment on the person that you prefer. And not in a negative sense, but in a positive sense. You say, the person I prefer and their gifts are superior to the gifts of the person that I do not prefer as much. And what you do is you become an arbiter and a judge over God and the way he dispenses gifts to different people for different purposes. Which is why Paul says, right? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, comma, as the Lord assigned to each. So if they came to faith through Apollos' preaching or Paul's preaching, it's no, it's, it's no way to determine the worth of Apollos or Paul because the Lord is assigned to both Paul and Apollos people that would come to them through their preaching. And so when you prefer one over the other, you say, oh, I decide which gifts are best. His And in so doing, you belittle the giver of the gift. In his infinite wisdom, who decided what each minister or servant could handle. It's a very prideful thing to do. And that's why we do it. The pride of affiliation. Right? We like to ride people's coattails. If we can't be great, we'll attach ourselves to somebody that is great and say, Hey, look how how greatly this great person loves me. You know, it's like, oh, Michael Scott. You got Dwight was given a speech, you know, and Jim printed off the speeches of all the famous dictators in the world. And Dwight went up there to this paper convention and he started reading, reading Stalin and beating his fist, you know, and the crowd went wild. And Michael got jealous and walked out. And Dwight came to him after speech. He said, yeah, did you see that? Michael's like, yeah, it was all right. And Michael kind of told a couple of jokes, and Dwight started laughing, and he said, look at that. I entertained the person that entertained all the other people. (laughs) That's what we do. And if it doesn't work in that direction, it works in the other direction. Right? So you can overemphasize somebody's gifts and callings, right, and follow John Piper or Matt Chandler or John MacArthur or whomever, Or you can go in the other direction and de-emphasize it to the point to where you say, I follow Christ. Which is why Paul responds, really doesn't come out on our English well. He says, is Christ divided? Another way to translate that is, is Christ portioned out? Has Christ been divided out between these groups? Does each of these groups just have a share of Christ? And you have the whole thing? Or do you have the whole thing and they don't have anything? Which is why he says in chapter 3, All things are yours. Verse 21. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or future. He's saying to these people that say, Well, while y'all are being factitious over there, I follow Christ. He says they're all yours. When you don't embrace the gifts that God gives to minister to the church and say, I'm going to be the Lone Ranger Christian, your pride just functions in a different direction. So pride on one hand can say, ooh, I'm going to get up to next to so-and-so and be great 
because a great person likes me. That's one direction. The complete opposite is I don't need any of those great people because I'm in Christ and Christ is great and Christ is in me and me, we can do this. And Paul says, that's wrong. The whole body has the entire head. So you have the pride of self-reliance and the pride of, what would you call it? Affiliation. That's the second thing that happens to us. Here's the third thing. We become disjointed. So having decapitated Christ from our head... And placing Peyton in his place, the entire body is out of joint. They're disjointed. They're out of place. Nothing works right. Because that's what we do. When we follow the celebrity pastor or preacher, we cut off Christ's head from the top of the body. We put the bobble head of the preacher that we love up there. Things go to a handbasket and we're like, what ha- what's going on? I don't know why there's so much strife. I don't know why we can't get... Well, that's what... The head's wrong. The head's wrong. you got a John Piper bobblehead up there. And it's supposed to be Christ. You have to lop it off. Put his head back. The reason I use this language, disjointed, is because of what it says in 1 Corinthians 1.10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you. Okay, that word divisions, literally schism, which means a condition resulting from splitting or tearing. All right. And the next word he uses, it says that you all be united. That word is used to talk about, I don't know, maybe, you know, those fake doctors, chiropractors. (laughs) For all my chiropractor friends watching. I worked for a dentist, Dr. Fitz, for a while, and that was our running joke, that Dr. Hedgepath was not a real doctor. (laughs) But it refers to somebody that puts joints back into place, putting things back into place. So don't be divided. Don't be, you got all this schisms going on, all these joints are out of place. Rather, put it back into place. Pop that shoulder back into place. That's what it refers to. We become disjointed. Fourth, there's five actually, I'm sorry. We trade wisdom for foolishness. When the cross of Christ becomes part of the pallet wall, we trade wisdom for foolishness. The cross of Christ, verses 23 and 24 of chapter 1, are called the power of God, and the wisdom of God. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. And Paul's point here is that although they've been given the riches of wisdom in Christ Jesus, they're not acting on it. So if you go to chapter 2, look at what he says. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Although it's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now skip to verse 12. Now we've received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Now look what he says in chapter 3. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, 
as infants of Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Do you see the point he's making? There's a spiritual way to look at these ministers of Christ and their gifts and their talents, and there's a fleshly way to look at it. When the cross becomes indiscernible to us, it becomes indiscernible to the world. Because without us discerning what the cross of Christ looks like and, and, and being receptive to the Spirit teaching us how to treat other people, there's no witness to it. That's what Paul said. You're, you're behaving like a like Blake and Adam. Who's the other judge now on the voice? Anybody know? Anybody watch that show anymore? Or John Legend. You know, that, that's a fleshly way to look at things. It judges it, listens, judges. Oh, that'll work, or that won't work, or I'm looking for this, or I'm looking for that. And Paul says that's not the way spiritually minded people do things. You're, you're listening to the gospel preached by these men and judging them like they're professional orators. Which was a big deal. For, I mean, they paid money to listen to these folks, and they supported them. And we trade power for weakness. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And this is so subtle, right? We empty the cross of Christ from his power in his name as a church. And we do it in ways that subvert the Holy Spirit in image for self-sufficiency. So you see when people manipulate emotions to try to get a response, get people saved. And really where this comes to fruition is how the church has enabled program-centric Moral, therapeutic, deistic, consumeristic Christianity that appeals to our short attention spans and our insatiable appetite for tweetable truths and our embarrassingly shallow minds, and we call it the gospel. That's what we do. We feed into the consumer mentality that makes the world spin. And we, can, we fill up churches with it. And we wonder why we have to postpone Sunday school class for a month. Because we can't find teachers. It's because we presented the gospel in such a way that it's almost indistinguishable between Home Depot and Lowe's and the gospel. We win people to Christ like corporations win people to their products. And we sit in awe and wonder why things aren't better in the church. Well, this is why. Because it's all about the lights, or the way the music sounds, or who's leading worship, or what the preacher says. We got all these things in place to get people in here. And folks, we can fill this place up with people that don't have a clue about who Jesus is. Not a clue. We can get all of our cohabitating couples married and not one of them know a thing about Jesus Christ. Our methods must match the truth of the gospel. So, 
When we lose sight of the cross of Christ and becomes part of the pallet wall, we forget that the church is a family and we start to judge all the people that serve in it and say, oh, I like this person, I don't, I like this one. We become dismembered because we prefer one to the other one. We dethrone our sovereign savior and install in his place one of his servants or ourselves. We trade wisdom for foolishness and we trade absolute Holy Spirit power for just weaknesses. What you win people with is what you win people to. So if you win people with a particular program and you take it away, guess who you lose? The person that you won. Because you didn't win them to Christ, you won them to something else. So that's why churches have five billion programs. And like two or three people participating. It's because they know intuitively that if they take away what they won them with, they'll leave. And so what Paul is calling for the people to do here is to keep the cross of Christ in the front of their minds and actually apply the theology of the cross to the way they relate to one another and to the people that minister to them. And that's what that means. That it means no one person is greater than Jesus Christ in the church. Not one. He is the head. What does the church need to grow? It doesn't need a new preacher. It needs Christ. It doesn't need a new worship leader. It needs Christ. It doesn't need a better curriculum. It needs Christ. Christ is the one that gives the growth. And the amount of growth happens because of the gift that Christ has given. Now, if this isn't your view of church, I want to offer you something. And if you're not on board, I want to offer you something. And it's not an exit ramp. Because Paul's writing to people whose view of church is not his. And he didn't say, I want to give you an exit ramp if you're just going to be a consumer Christian. He didn't say that. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind, And in the same judgment. He offers an invitation to agree, to end the divisions, and to be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. And that same mind and same judgment, I'm running out of time here, is Christ centeredness. You get it in chapters 9, verses 9 through 13. You get it in chapter 2, verse 16, right? When he says, We have the mind of Christ. And then immediately he says, but our brothers could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you're not ready for it. And even now you're not ready, for you, for you are still of the flesh. For while there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I'll follow Paul or I'll follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What is he mean when he says, be of the same mind. Does that mean we have to agree on every theological point? No, it's not what it means. Here is what it means. Have the same mind. Chapter 1, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 16. We have the mind of Christ. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But, if you're divided against one another, I'm a Paul or I'm a Paulus, You're of the flesh. You're not of the spirit. So what Paul means when he says, let us have the same mind, is this. Let us be a church that is what we call Christocentric, Christ-centered, above all else, above above its ministers, above its pastors, above the people that exercise their gifts. And we end with this. Christ was wounded to mend what was broken and, and to set what is out of place back into place. I think this is the most profound point of the entire study of these few verses. And that is, 
in order to have peace with one another, we go to the same place that we went to to have peace with God. And that's the cross. So like Isaiah chapter 53, right? Isaiah 53 verse 5. Some of you can quote it. I walk by faith, but I preach by sight. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. It's the beautiful thing about it. We go to have peace with one another to the same place we went to have peace with God. And that is the cross. The cross is the final word. From beginning to end, that is the final word. When a church can't get along, what do they need? A robust reminder of the cross of Jesus Christ. If you are lost as last year's Easter egg and your life's beginning to smell like one, what do you need to go? The cross of Jesus Christ. We never outgrow it. We, we never outgrow our need of the message of Christ crucified on our behalf. Paul wasn't crucified for us. We weren't baptized in the name of Paul. And so this is my invitation. That if you are a Christian and you are a member of this church and a part of this church, that you will join me in being Christ-centered. And if you're not a Christian, that the, the truth of Isaiah 53, 5, would just wash over you. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes, you are healed. You're healed. Christ mends everything. He puts back into place everything, whether or not it's his church or it's you who are about to be part of his church. Either way, I commend to you now the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your cross. Thank you for your word, for its relevancy. Thank you for showing us how to treat one another and how to relate to one another so that we're not tempted to say, I follow Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Jeremiah or Darren or Jonathan or Daniel or whomever. But that we would follow Christ and rejoice in the different gifts that you've given to the body to minister to itself. That we wouldn't be judges over the superiority or value of those gifts. But that this, this place, this group of people would be a family. United, purchased by your blood. United by a common faith and a common Savior. And that we would grow in every way. And to you who are the head. That we would get our strength from you. So that as you tell us in the book of Ephesians, we as the body perfectly equipped and joined together may help the body grow. And God, I pray for those who aren't Christians that you would help them to see the beauty of Jesus Christ. Christ crucified for us. Saved or unsaved, crucified for us. Given freely to us. And you would help us run to him and trust him. Holy Spirit, do your work. Glorify Jesus Christ. Thank you for the cross and the final word it has over our lives. Pray that you would help us trust the man who, hang, who was hung up on it for our iniquities and transgressions. We love you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.